Conspirators without a plan. Five very nervous people were waiting for Cicero at Antium. There he found them. Five people with no plan. No plan, no order, no reason among them. He thought with disgust and no idea at how to keep the ship of state from going to pieces. First of all, there was Brutus, a very serious man in his late thirties, who seemed to guard his honor and virtue with rigid dignity. It was plain to see that he carefully weighed his every act and hoped never to be found guilty. The second was Portia, the good wife of Brutus. The third was Brutus's mother, Servilia, a spirited, tangy woman, obviously popular with men. In her younger days, it was said she had been so friendly with Caesar that he practically looked upon Brutus as his son. According to gossip, that was the reason for his keen grief and shock when Brutus stabbed him. The first was Tertia, a half-sister to Brutus, who was now married to Cassius. Cassius himself made the fifth, a lean, hungry man with a sharp nose and a sharp tongue. Having formed the original plot against Caesar and enlisted Brutus in it, he was now annoyed at Brutus for not letting them kill Mark Antony too while the daggers were out. Brutus tried to conceal his righteous indignation. He had behaved only as he believed his great ancestor would have behaved, that noble Brutus of old, whose statue stood on the Capilone, Capitoline. Cassius had no ancestor to worry him, thank Jupiter, and he didn't spare the critical remarks about lost opportunities. Cicero answered that they should let all bygones by, be bygones, then in the next breath offered his own ideas of mistakes that had been made. After Caesar was killed, he said, you two, Brutus and Cassius, should have taken charge. Nonsense, exclaimed Servi- Ser- Servile, cutting him short. Brutus said flatly that they had no wish to become dictators. It had seized control. They would have been guilty of just what they had killed Caesar for. Their part was over when they got rid of the tyrant and returned the Republic to the people of Rome. Now it was up to the Senate to take charge again. Not that he wished to shirk his duty, he hastened to add. He would have gladly go back to Rome if Cicero thought best. Cicero did not think best, not at all. It would not be safe. True, he had persuaded the Senate to pass an act of oblivion the day after Caesar's death. In other words, for the sake of peace, they had agreed to forget what the conspirators had done. But now, who could tell what, when Anthony would choose to ignore that decree or set it aside? Portia trembled at the thought and spoke of how near the mob had come to burning down their house after Caesar's funeral. Servilia thought Brutus and Cassius ought to be abroad as grain commissioners. She had taken pains to have Anthony, who was still her friend, get those jobs assigned to them. They should be glad of a real excuse to leave Egypt, uh, leave Italy, and avoid civil war if they could. Brutus admitted he would be willing to go anywhere to avoid war, though he would hardly choose to be a grain commissioner. Choose it, sneered Cassius. It was an insult. Judges deserved a better assignment than that. He and Brutus had been judges for the year. Would they now take a job rusting grain to feed their common mob of Rome, whom Caesar had toted to? Not by Jove's thunderbolt, he wouldn't. What, then, will you do, inquired Cicero. Go to Greece, perhaps. Somewhere, anywhere, Cassius was thinking that he could get hold of troops and money in case his friends of Caesar should organize for war. Brutus was inclined to go to Asia when the gathering broke up. As for Cicero, he returned home, disgusted with his journey, in despair over the poor, old, rickety ship of state, and pleased with nothing at all as he wrote Atticus, except the fact that he had not let his dear Brutus leave Italy without seeing him again. It was not long before Brutus and Cassius both set forth from Italy, but as it turned out, they switched their destination. Cassius headed for Asia and Palestine, and Brutus went to Greece. From the port, he sent a parting letter to Antony, who probably laughed out loud when he read it. Do not flatter yourself that you have frightened us, wrote Brutus. Fear is beneath our character. We hate war. Nothing can drag us into it.